Ever wish you could probe non-conductive parts on your desktop CNC? If so, stick around, because in this episode, we're making a micro-digital touch probe from scratch. Hey there. So you've got a CNC, you've learned the basic software that comes with it, maybe even upgraded to something more capable. Something with macros, probing, and advanced features. And as you grow with your machine, you'll want to improve your process. Things like simplifying the task of edge finding on your stock, or digitizing and surface probing. Uh, probing is nothing new, and while many CNC support basic XYZ probe blocks, anything beyond that requires a touch probe or a conductive stock. While for their big brother, this isn't an issue, for desktop mills, there are a couple of problems. Touch probes are big, they come in all shapes and sizes, and mechanical touch probes rely on size and width for their accuracy. Unfortunately, the Z budget on a desktop CNC is small, generally around 3 inches or less. And while probe blocks are useful for finding corners and surface height, they can't be used for advanced surface probing unless your part is conductive. Now, I mill a lot of materials on my machines, and unfortunately, most of them are not conductive. Now, touch probes are nothing new. Lots of people have made them, and the majority of them fall into two buckets, mechanical or digital. You might say they're all digital, they're on or off. Well, mechanical probes traditionally follow the pattern that of the Renishaw patent from 1990, a laterally constrained mechanical configuration comprised of kinematic arrangement of cylinders and balls together with a planar spring. That's from the patent. In layman's terms, it's got three equally spaced contacts attached to the stylus and a spring to keep it biased to the center. Then if the stylus moves enough to break any of those three contacts, the circuit's open and a touch signal sent to your machine. The main downside of this approach is that the amount of movement required by the stylus to break contact is proportional to the width of the contacts, which explains why these probes are generally larger in size. Digital probes, on the other hand, are a newer breed of sensor circuits that can detect extremely minute fluctuations in voltage using sensitive electromechanical probes or laser light. The voltage is then amplified and used to flip a logic gate that opens or closes a circuit connected to your machine. The benefit of the digital probe is that their accuracy is non-mechanical, so their precision is less proportional to their mechanical design and size, as it were. For that reason, I based my design on creating a digital touch probe to see just how small I can make this probe without sacrificing precision, accuracy, or functionality that the industrial probes are known for. After doing some research of potential optical and electromechanical options, I decided to go with the most simplistic approach of using a piezo ceramic disc to detect minute touch of a stylus. This component would be coupled with a Schmidt trigger to convert the analog voltage generated by the piezo ceramic device into a digital output that can be sent to the machine. Now for sourcing the parts, I went with a 12 millimeter piezo, an LM358 op amp, a feedback LED, and several resistors and capacitors to define the threshold of the Schmidt trigger and a low pass filter for the probe connection. All of these parts were 0603 surface mount components to keep the circuit footprint minimal. For the circuit design, I wire up the schematic using an op amp, resistors, and capacitors to create the inverting Schmidt trigger and low pass filter. And with the circuit complete, it's time to build the body of the probe around it. Back in Fusion 360, I have a few things in mind. The main goal is to keep it under a cubic inch in size, tiny. Also to incorporate the ability to tram the probe as well as use a magnetic quick connect connector and a ruby tip stylus. With those things in mind, I started with the stylus and began to model the solution from there. I modeled the adjustable stylus tray and piezo effector. This will be a component that interacts with the piezo ceramic when any movement occurs. Next I create the brass nose. This will enclose the probe internals and host the three adjustable grub screws to tram in the stylus. This will be a two-part assembly, and to connect the parts, I apply M18 threads to an internal lip on the cylinder. Next, I model the top side from aluminum, which will house the circuit board and expose the pins for the connector. This initial design will have a quarter-inch shaft, but it could be swapped out for an eighth-inch shaft if needed or desired. For the connector, I'll use pogo pins. Next, I model those, then the board, the spring, and connector to finish off the design. With the design coming together, I export the board shape, then go back to design the PCB. Even though the parts are tiny, this board is packed. To keep it simple, with the goal to keep it single-sided design, I manually wrought the board to finesse the final board design. With the board design complete, it would have been nice to mill this simple circuit. Unfortunately, the 10 mil signal traces and the 0603 component footprints makes this a bit of a challenge to mill. So it's JLC PCB to save the day. I head over to jlcpcb.com and drag the Gerber file onto the order form. It's uploaded and a preview is rendered. 
For the most part, the defaults are a good start. You just need to select the quantity, color, finish, and we're good to go. In this case, we're going to use a thin one millimeter board and having them panelize these small boards to simplify the assembly process. I submit the order for processing and that's going to take about a week. With the boards being manufactured, it's back to making the rest of the parts for this probe. Now these parts are tiny and complicated. And while you could 3D print them with resin, it wouldn't provide the quality and performance that I'm going for in this design. To do these justice, we'll be milling them from brass and aluminum on a pocket NC210. As these are complicated parts, even for the 5-axis machine, this will require some planning. To do that, I save out the individual parts of the design, then start a new design for the part setup. In the setup design, I pull in the pocket NC B table and call it to hold the 25 millimeter bar stock that I'll be milling these from. This is used to position and reference the machine zero for all the operations that'll be performed on the part. If you're new to 5-axis and interested in learning more, I've put a link to a description to a video I created on just that. For now, with the fixture in place, it's time to plan the operations for the nose. As this part has internal and external operations, my strategy is to mill the internal threads first then mount the part on a threaded fixture to mill the external features. For the internal operations, I create the part setup and define the stock as a 25 millimeter rod and leverage the fixer offset origin as the work coordinate system. With that, I start defining the internal operations, starting by facing the stock for a clean surface. Next to 2D adaptive operation, I mill the outer surface down to spec using a 1 8 inch three flute flat end mill at eight inches per minute and 20 thou depth of cut. With the outer surface at spec, I use three 2D pocket operations to clear out and hollow the part, all running at the same end mill feeds and speeds. Next, I'll run a threading operation to cut the threads into the internal surface of the part. For this, I'm using a MicroTools TM18018 single thread cutting end mill. The most important aspect of this operation is that contrary to your settings in the Fusion 360 design, you'll need to set the thread pitch and depth again in the operation to be correct. For this operation, I'm cutting M18 threads at 0.75 millimeter pitch and one millimeter diameter offset. That will complete the internal operations of the nose. The second operation will be rotated 180 degrees and screwed onto a fixture using the threads that were just milled. These operations will consist of a facing operation to prepare the face of the nose. Next, I'll run a spiral operation to clean up and finish the nose using a two flute ball end mill running at eight inches per minute and 20 thou depth of cut. Finally, I run three drilling operations to prepare the pilot holes for the grub screw adjusters. With that, I post-process these out of Fusion 360, then open up the Pocket NC web interface to upload and run the files. Again, the most important part of uploading and executing the operation is measuring the correct tool index that's leveraged by the operation. Once the internal of the second part is milled, it's time to flip it to mount for the external operations. I mill a rod with M18 threads that will mate with this part. To make things easier, I cut the part from the bar and screw it onto the threaded fixture. Next I run the external operations to complete the features on the nose. With the nose complete and the part still on the rod, I sand and polish the part to a brilliant finish. If you're interested in that process, I've put a link in the description to another video that covers that in great detail. Back in Fusion 360, I set up the top part in its first orientation. For it, we start with the same facing operation to clean up the stock. Next, just like the other part, I mill the outside faces to spec using a couple 2D adaptive operations, running 1 8 inch 3 flute flat end mill at 8 inches per minute and 20 thou depth of cut. 
Following that, I run three pocket operations to clear out the main cavity using the same end mill feeds and speeds. After that, we'll use a 1 16th inch two flute flat end mill to mill out some magnet pockets inside the part. And finally, we'll mill the M18 threads on the top of that part again using the Microtools TM18018 single thread cutting end mill. That completes the internal operations of the top. Just like the first part, the second orientation will be rotated 180 degrees and screwed onto a fixture using the threads that were just milled. These operations will consist of a facing operation to prepare the stock. Next, I'll run the 3D adaptive to remove the bulk of the material using a two flute ball end mill and running at eight inches per minute and 20 thou depth of cut. I run several contour operations to bring the part to spec dimensions. Then finally, I run a ramp operation on the whole part to finish the surface using a two flute ball end mill, running it again, eight inches per minute and 20 thou depth of cut. With that, I post process these out to Fusion 360, then open up Pocket NC web interface to upload and run the files. The internal operations are ran, and then it's time to flip the part. To mount it for the external operations, I milled a rod with M18 threads that I'll use to mate with this part to make things easier. I cut the part from the bar and screwed it onto the threaded fixture. Next I run the external operations to complete the features on this top part. To finish off the part, I sand and polish it to a brilliant finish, just so it looks good. With the two most difficult parts complete, there are several internal components that need to be made. A pogo pin isolator, a piezo stylus tray, the piezo effector, and connector housing. These parts are resin printed using the Formlabs Form 3. To do that, I export the parts from Fusion 360, then load them into the Formlabs slicer preform. These small parts are printed on the build plate without any supports using black resin. 30 minutes later, we got the internal parts. They're cleaned in IPA and left to air dry. The remaining hardware, including the grub screws and springs, were purchased from McMasterCar.com. The last piece was the stylus, available in various lengths. I went with the 25 millimeter length for this initial design. With the boards ordered and the parts ready to go, let's do a dry run assembly to see how these parts all come together. First, the three grub screws are screwed into the brass nose. Next, the stylus is screwed into the piezo tray. The tray is inserted into the nose and seated against the grub screws. Then the piezo effector and spring are seated onto the piezo tray. The connector magnets are pressed into the top half of the probe. The pin isolator and pseudo circuit board are seated up into the top part of the probe. Next, the top and bottom are threaded together. The stylus can be adjusted for run out and the probe is good to go. Looking pretty nice, right? It's just missing that circuit board. Now that's gonna do it for this video. When I get the boards back from manufacturing, we'll go through the process of testing the probe precision and using it to do some part probing and surface mapping on the mills. Hopefully you enjoyed this look at milling these complex parts on the Pocket NC. The usefulness of this machine never fails to surprise me, and while you could have fixtured these on a 3-axis machine, 
The five axis capabilities of the Pocket NC really simplify the task with getting these complicated multi-operation parts done. Just a heads up, on the pendant circuit boards, I was going to ask for a shipping payment, but I was able to find a cheap alternative. So those have all went out if you were in the first 25 people, and you'll be getting your boards shortly. Again, thanks for participating. We're going to hope to do more of that in the future. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and ring that notification bell. It'll help keep you notified when new videos are released. And if you like this particular video, give it a thumbs up. It lets me know you care. Anyway, thanks for watching, and in the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too. And now, drum roll, please. The person that's winning the Arcader 3 handheld. I don't think I forgot about this. I just haven't mentioned it, waiting for people to build the anticipation and all that fun stuff. This guy is going, going to be sent out to one of you lucky members. And that winner is...